We're in a series, and it's loving like Jesus, and what that actually means. And we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now, and I believe that what we're talking about, it has the potential not only to change our lives, but to change our families' lives, to change our friends, our neighbors, our classmates, our community, our church, what we're talking about. I mean, just imagine this with me. Imagine if Jesus' followers... People who say that, yes, we we follow Jesus Christ. Just imagine if just the Jesus followers began to simply love like Jesus. If if that we just love like Jesus, if we just woke up every single day and we said, you know, my purpose, my sole purpose today is to love like Jesus. I wake up every day and I'm gonna love my wife, or I'm gonna love my husband, or I'm gonna love my children just like Jesus. I'm going to go to work and I'm going to love the people I work with. Now, whoa, wait a minute. But yeah, we're going to love the people we work with like we love Jesus. Bosses, you're going to love your employees like you love Jesus. Employees, you're going to love your boss like you love Jesus. Students, you're going to love your classmates like you love Jesus. And you're going to love your teachers. Draw a line. You're going to draw, love your teachers like you love Jesus. And teachers, <laughs> you got to love those kids like you love Jesus. Imagine if we got up every single day and that was our goal. Is, hey, today I just simply want to love like Jesus. What would that look like? What would that actually look like? Well, we, that's what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks is we're looking at three different aspects of Jesus' life, three different areas of Jesus' life and how these images that he gave us and provided an example of, these images give us a picture of how Jesus loved and how he wants us as his followers to love others. So we're looking at what it's like to love like Jesus. First thing that we talked about, if I turn this on, it would work. First thing we talked about is Jesus forgives sinners. Aren't you thankful for that? Because guess what? You were a sinner. (laughs) I'm a sinner. Jesus forgives sinners. He not only forgives sinners, but he he, he loves them and he calls us as his followers to do the same thing. He, He said, you're to forgive those who sin against you. You're to forgive those who harm you. This is at the very heart of the gospel. Jesus came to forgive sinners. And that includes you and that includes me. We've been forgiven and he calls on us to forgive one another as well. In fact, Jesus said this. He said, this is how the skeptics This is how your your enemies, this is how your neighbors, your classmates, this is how your family, this is how your co-workers, this is how all these people will know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. He said they'll know that by the way that you love and the way that you forgive. In fact, that was the distinguishing mark, Jesus said, of his followers is the way they love, the way they forgive. And we even broke that down a little bit that first week and we said, what does that look like? That means that we we pray for those that hurt us. This wasn't my idea, okay? This wasn't something I dreamed up back in the office. This is something Jesus said. He said, I want you to pray for those who hurt you. And then he said, I want you to forgive others the same way that I forgave you. So Jesus forgives sinners. Last week we talked about this one. Jesus washes feet. Jesus washes feet. He had a final meal with his disciples the night before they're going to beat him and torture him and crucify him. And he's gathered his followers together, his closest friends. He's gathered them for this meal. And and usually they had a foot washer at the door. When people come in, they would wash their feet and clean off the dust and the dirt from walking around on dusty roads. And he gets to the meal and there's no foot washer. And he looks around the room and all of his followers, they're talking about who's the greatest among them and who's going to be the top dog and all this kind of stuff. And Jesus looks around the room and all he sees, all he sees is proud hearts and dirty feet. Proud hearts. And dirty feet. And Jesus looked around the room and he said, I can do something about that. I can do something about that. And he gets a basin of water and a towel and he goes and he begins to wash their feet. And in that moment, he demonstrated. He didn't just teach it and preach it, but he actually demonstrated living color. He said, the greatest is the one who will be the servant of all. 
It's about making a difference. It's about meeting needs. It's about serving for the glory of God. And as Christ followers, we come, and, and, and I said this last week, and I said it again this week, as Christ followers, we gather today not as consumers. If you came to say, well, come feed me, or what does your church have to offer? You got the wrong church, okay? You got the wrong church. Because as Christ followers, we're not consumers, we're contributors. We contribute. Foot washers and servants. And they always ask this question, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? What can I do to serve? How can I help? How can I make a difference? Because you see, here's what happens. When you serve others, God changes lives. And it's usually your life that He's going to change. And we get the thrill of partnering with God and doing His work, being used by God to do some incredible things. So today we're going to look at the third image from Christ's life. What does it mean to love like Jesus? And here it is. Jesus breaks bread. And you're going, huh? Jesus breaks bread bread. It's interesting, Jesus was described in Scripture, they described Him like this, they, they said, Jesus came eating and drinking. That's how the religious people described, they said, Jesus came eating and drinking. In other words, what they were saying was, was, was Jesus came doing life. Okay, he was just doing life with people. He would go to their house and have dinners. It didn't matter if they were Christ's followers. It didn't matter if they were the worst people with the worst reputation in town. He would go to their house and they would sit and they would have a meal and they would eat together. And, and, and Jesus did life with people. The New Testament meals were more than just something that and, and enjoying good food. Okay, it was more than just sitting around a table and say, okay, we're going to have a meal, we're going to eat, we're going to go home. Meals in that time, is, when you had a meal, it's when you invited people that you loved and people that you didn't even know. You invited them to a meal. You invited them into your home to, to have fellowship with them. And the meals could last for hours. It wasn't like we're just going to rush in, we're going to eat a meal, let's get up, start cleaning the table, do the dishes, and we'll see you next time. These meals could last for hours. And in fact, there was kind of a divine nature to meals. There was a divine nature. Many believe that you truly experience God and His best while you were eating meals together. And in fact, many in the, the first century believers in the early church, they really believed that you could experience God best in the context of community as you were breaking bread together and just doing life together. So today we're going to look at that imagery of breaking bread or, or community together. And we find it in the book of Acts. This was the early church. This was the very beginning of church. And it's the book of Acts chapter 2. And they're modeling for us what church is supposed to be like. And it starts out like this. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And they fellowship. And they share in meals, including the Lord's Supper, which we'll do at the end of this service. And they had a prayer together. A deep sense of awe came over all of them. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers, important right here, all the believers met together in one place and they shared everything that they had. They sold their property and their possessions and they shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper. Very, very interesting here. It said they were in community together. They were all coming together because they had this awesome, deep, committed fellowship. They were committed to one another. They were meeting in homes and they were meeting in the church and they were doing life together. And it goes on to say they worshiped together at the temple each day and, and met in homes for the Lord's Supper. And then he says, uh, continues, he says, and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity and all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, this is incredible, each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. In other words, they experienced 
True community. True community. They were together. They did life together. It's so interesting. I read this paper this week. And it said the paper was about why it's harder for us today to have community together than it was in years past. I'll read a little bit of it to you. It says one of the things that changed relationships for the worst was actually air conditioning. Yeah. Now, some of you may remember this. I remember my grandparents' house and, and, and even great grandparents. But I remember they didn't have air conditioning. So in the evenings when it was hot, the thing they would do to cool off is they would go out on the front porch and sit. Anybody remember? Some of you will remember that. Uh, some of you are going, no air. Was there ever a time there wasn't any air conditioning? I mean, what are you talking about? That's foreign. But they would go out and sit on the front porch to cool off. And I remember doing that at my grandparents' house. And what they would do, they'd sit out on the front porch and the neighbors across the street, they'd be on their front porch and they'd wave and the neighbor next door would walk over and they'd start talking about the day and, and you'd sit out in these chairs on the front porch and you would just rest. And they knew more about their neighbor. They probably knew way too much about their neighbors, but they knew more about their neighbors than most of us do today. They were sitting out on the front porch. For the air conditioner, you sat on the front porch on hot evenings and you actually interacted with neighbors. He goes on, he says, there was also a change from the detached garage to the attached garage. Years ago, garages were separate from the house. So you actually had to pull into the garage, get out and walk across the, the yard or walk across the span of grass. And as you were walking, you saw neighbors. And you waved, and hey, neighbor, hi, how are you? How was your day? Good. Yeah. And you interacted with your neighbor. But then they attached the garages to houses. So now you pulled up to your house, you got out, quick wave to the neighbor, you flipped the door open, pulled the car in, got out, pulled the car down, and then they invented the remote. So no longer did you have to get out of your car and wave at the neighbor. You just open the remote, you drive into your car, you hit the remote, the door comes down, safe, in your air-conditioned house. And then we had fences. People used to didn't fence their yard in, but we started fencing our yard in. We fenced yard in so we didn't have to see the neighbors. And if you had enough money... You gated them out. You lived in a gated neighborhood to keep people out and fences the rest of your house to keep people from seeing you so that when you got home, you could drive into your attached garage, open the door, pull in, close the door behind you, and walk into your air conditioning house, and you didn't have to see or interact with your neighbors. And then in my lifetime, they invented something called the answering machine. Remember that? Some of you may still have that. People would call, hello, we're not at home right now, but if you'd leave a message at the beep, we'll get back to you. And how many of you, don't raise your hand, but how many of you would be home, that would go off, and you'd sit there and listen to it and go, I don't know if I want to talk to this person or not. Let's see who it is. And we would scan our calls. And then we got caller ID. Now, these are great things. I'm not saying, you know, let's go back to the old days. These are wonderful things. I'm just telling you. What's happened? Used to, we would go to a store and shop and actually interact with a salesperson or a checkout person, and now we do it online from our air-conditioned home because we don't want to see people. And then they created Instagram and Facebook, and now we can just look at their pictures and double-tap and just say, yeah, we like you, we love you, Oh, smiley face, smiley face. <gasps> you know, and we just tap and we're done. We don't have to interact. We don't have to see them anymore face to face. And we text our friends. That's a far cry, isn't it? From the type of community he's describing here in Acts 2, the early church where they met together in their homes daily. In fact, I, I love this rewrite of Acts chapter 2. It's, I guess we could really say it is a modern version. Here's the way it would read, modern day, Acts 2. The Christians were devoted to themselves and occasionally got to church when they had time. No one was filled with awe because there were no signs and wonders performed 
by the believers. Very few believers were together and they had almost nothing in common because they had no real time for each other. If they sold something, they used the money to buy something better for themselves. They ate on the run, they kept to themselves, and they were too rushed to enjoy one another or give praise to God. They claimed to love God, but they didn't really love each other. And they felt empty and alone. And as a result, most people disliked them, and very few people were saved. Ouch. Which one sounds more accurate of the church? In fact, this is almost a little bit scary, isn't it? Well, I'd like to propose something better, much better, this morning. And that is a committed community of people. Committed to each other. To break bread together because they love one another deeply and they truly want to celebrate the presence of God. But you see, the problem is this. The problem is we live in a world that highly values independence. Independence. We want to be financially independent. We want to be relationally independent. In other words, it boils down to this. I don't want to have to need you in my life. You see, to be a follower of Jesus is directly opposite of being independent. It's actually to be dependent. We didn't create ourselves. We can't save ourselves. We are completely dependent upon the grace, the love, and the forgiveness, and the presence of God, and upon each other because we're part of a body and we're incomplete without each other. So we best experience the presence of God together when we're in community. Now I want to give you a couple of thoughts this morning on on loving like Jesus or, or living in community. And the first one is this, share the love of Jesus with others at church. The scripture says, let us think of ways to motivate one another, acts of love and of good works. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a community where you get together and you say, how can we help each other? How can we show love to each other? Imagine being a part of a community where you get together and you said, how can we make a bigger difference? How can we make a bigger difference in the world? How can we together as a community, how can we together as a church, how can we impact things far beyond the walls of this church? And I'm so glad this church does that. We we support an orphanage in Africa. We support a church in Spain that that specifically targets Muslims and, and, and giving the gospel of Christ to them. We support a teen challenge who takes in troubled teens, addicted teens, and they work with them over a period of a year, have something like a 90 something percent success rate and helping these these teens and these these adults come clean from addictions in their life. We support locally a a pregnancy center for for those that have unwanted pregnancies that reach out to them. And we support a a, a girl's home that reaches out to troubled teens. And we support things outside the walls. And these are things that we couldn't do necessarily on our own, but collectively, we can make a difference. We can partner together. So how can we make a difference in our town? How can we show the love of Jesus in our town? How can we serve in our church and make a difference? I love the words of Hebrews 10, 24-25. He said, and let us not neglect meeting together. Some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of the Lord and His return is drawing near. He said one of the biggest challenges we have today is giving up meeting together in community, in corporate meeting, in corporate worship. I think we could all agree presence matters, doesn't it? I'm always here in this, this line. I've said it before, but they, people say, well, I won't be there Sunday, but I'll be there in spirit. And I'm looking out there going, okay, now which chair has their spirit in it? You know, I, Spirit doesn't do anything. Presence does. Presence makes a difference. It's about being together and experiencing something meaningful. Put it this way. How about, you know, we we get together with family and friends and Alabama-Auburn game 
All right? That, that, that interests most every person in the room. Alabama-Auburn games coming up real soon. And we're, get, we're planning. We're going to get together. The family's going to get together. We're going to watch the game. And we're actually inviting a few friends if they're for our team. And we're inviting them over to watch the game with us. And they get there and you go, okay, glad everybody came. This is the big game. A lot on the line. And, and I'm going to watch the game in the living room on the big screen. And mom's going to watch the game upstairs in the bedroom on her TV. And little Johnny, he's going to watch this game on his iPad in his bedroom. And little Susie, she's got her iPhone, and she can watch the game on her iPhone. And she's going to watch it in her room. And your guests that you've invited, you go, hey, there's a TV in the guest room. One of you can go there, and there's one out in the playroom. The other one can go there. And we're all going to watch. It comes on at 7 o'clock, so everybody get to your places, and let's watch the game. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. It's not nearly as fun watching it separately as it is coming together and experiencing the game in community. As a group, we come together and we're like, oh, we're cheering, we're throwing stuff, we're jumping over furniture. I mean, we're having a time because we're experiencing something together. An alarming statistic, I read this this week, the uh, average, average American Christian, the average American Christian attends church once a month. Once a month. We're all busy people. There's always going to be something going on. So I believe it just boils down to this. It boils down to priority. We're going to make it a priority. If you often trump church, getting together with other people, family members, believers, if you often trump church for something else, well, the weather was bad, so we just didn't get, or I had some yard work to catch up on, or some work at the office I needed to catch up on, I was just tired, oh, the game went late last night, or, you know, we're out of town this week, and next week, and the third week, and the eighth week, and we're going to be out of town. If it's always, if you're always trumping church for something else, and you're never ever trumping something else, to be in community together with other believers in the presence of God, then don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when your kids grow up and they don't value community. And they don't see the importance of God. Listen, if you want something better, you have to choose something better. And there is something better. There is to worship God, to share Jesus together in community, committed corporately to worshiping God together in community. We worship together. We pray for each other. We, we hurt with each other. We serve with each other. Just being present and involved in each other's lives. Jesus broke bread. He did life together with a group. And then the second thing is this. Share the love of God or the love of Jesus with a small group. We share it in big group, corporate, church, Sunday morning, everybody. We share it together with them, but we share together in a small group or a community. We share together with a small group or community of people committed to a group that we say, hey, we'll do life together. We'll support one another. We'll encourage one another. We'll learn from one another. We'll share with one another. In fact, this church you're sitting in today, it started with a small group of 16 people sitting in a living room. We sat in a living room and decided, hey, we're going to do life together. We're going to do something to make a difference together. It started as a small group, doing life together. We come together for corporate worship, yeah, teaching and prayer and worship together, but we do life in groups. And even though there's a, a, a lot of positives to doing life, life in groups, it can be messy at times because we're all imperfect people. But that's what makes groups so wonderful is that we're just a group of imperfect people to get together and say, hey, here's where I struggle. This is where I struggle. This is what I did. That's stupid. Well, you did this. That's stupid. Well, let's be stupid together. Let's learn and let's grow and become better. We need a small group that, we can, that can correct us when we stray, that can love us when we're down, pray for us when we're hurting, comfort us when we experience loss, celebrate our wins with us and we can learn from and serve with each other. 
Go back to our scripture. He said, all the while they were doing this, all the while they were meeting in groups and homes, breaking bread together and loving and doing life together, all the while praising God and enjoying goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. I noticed two things in this. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens on purpose. When you purposefully, intentionally say, hey, I'm going to step out. I'm going to decide to just step out and just connect with a group. I'm going to get out of my little world and invite other people in and we're going to do life together. It doesn't happen by accident. And the other thing is when you do this, when you start meeting in groups and you're growing together and loving on each other, it becomes attractive to other people. They go, I want to be in a group. I want to be a part. I want to experience that as well. Why did Jesus come? Scripture said He came to give us life. To give us life abundantly. How did Jesus come? He said, I came breaking bread. I just came breaking bread and drinking and doing life with people. Experiencing life with people. And as Jesus followers, He said, hey, I want you to break bread. I want you to do life together in community. Band's going to come up and get ready to do a final song and we're going to get ready for communion. We're going to share together. And this is what's so neat is communion... Communion, what we're about to do, it is a symbol of community. 